I'm going to read the first six verses of the book of Ruth. So it says this, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Marlon and Chilion. They were Epaphrites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Marlon and Chilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. Amen. Uh, so, some of the questions that we um, that we ask of God, um, or I do anyway, and I'm sure you do as well, are questions like this: Does does God care about my life? Uh, does God care about my situation? Uh, does He care about my suffering? Will God provide for my needs? Is he interested in my life? Uh, and these are questions that we ask ourselves because the God of the Bible that we read about is a God who is over all things and he's the great creator of the world. And so we, we wonder if, if he is so great and if he is the creator, then is he still involved with the world? Well, the book of Ruth is going to answer these questions with a, with a big fat yes. Uh, God does care. God is involved with our lives. God does provide for our needs. And God is ruling over all things. And one of the main themes that this book will bring out, and we'll see this as we go on, is something that uh, the theologians call God's providence. Uh, put simply, it means that God sustains and rules the world and he's active in it. Uh, God sustains and rules the world and he's active in it. And we see this in the book of Ruth, that God's very active uh, uh, in the characters or, uh, found in this book and um, in the storyline that we're going to see uh, in this book as well. So if you're asking the question, does God care about my life? The answer from the book of Ruth is yes, he does. He very much does and he does have a plan he has a purpose and he's working all things out for our good and his glory uh, so just before we get into the book just a few um facts about the book before we just read the text a few background things and the first thing that we need to know about the book of Ruth is that it's set in the the time of the judges it's set in the time of the judges uh, and if you don't know what that is, that was the time or the period of time after Joshua had died uh, uh, until the rise of the monarchy under Samuel. So Joshua has died. They're in the promised land. Uh, Joshua has led them there. Joshua has died. And um, uh, uh, it's that period before um, uh, Saul and then David become king. So there's no king at this time. And the book of Judges is actually not a very good, um, not a very good book in terms of uh, the people's spirituality, because the book of Judges documents the people of God being unfaithful to Him. Uh, and what usually what happens in the book of Judges, if you read through it, and I want to read through it now, but you can go and look at it later on, is that uh, the people disobey God. They're unfaithful to him. God then disciplines them by sending enemies to attack them. The people call out to God because they're in a mess. Uh, and then God rescues them by the hands of the judges. And that goes on in a cycle over and over again. And basically the book of Judges gets worse and worse as you go on. If you were to read it from chapter one to the end, it's not good at the first. Uh, it's not good at 
in the first couple of chapters, but it gets worse and worse throughout the book. Uh, and the statement that sums up what's going on in the book of Judges is this. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. In, every, in other words, during the time of the Judges uh, and during the time of Ruth, everyone did what they wanted. Didn't care about the Lord, didn't care about his ways. Uh, they just did their own thing. Uh, but Ruth, in comparison to the Judges, even though it's in the same time, shows that not everyone has turned away from the Lord. That there are those who are trusting the Lord. There are those who are following his ways. Uh, and the book of Ruth will show us God's grace and it will show us uh, some of the people that are being faithful to God, even in the time of the judges. So the first thing I want you to know about the book of Ruth, the book of Ruth is set in the, in the time of the judges. The second thing I want you to know, uh, and it's obvious because it's the name of the book, but the, the name of the book is, is, is Ruth. And she's one of the three main characters that we find in Ruth. The three main characters are Ruth, uh, Boaz, and Naomi. And the fact that the book is named after Ruth, and we're going to see this throughout the book, is amazing because Ruth is not an Israelite. Uh, in fact, Ruth uh, is the only uh, non-Israelite uh, it's the book that's only named after a non-Israelite in the whole of the Old Testament. Uh, so there's no other book, all other books named after Israelites or, or to do with the Jews, but this is the only book written, uh, sorry, that is named after a, a non-Israelite, uh, Ruth. So that's quite amazing. We're going to see how the Lord uses this foreigner to bring about his purposes, again, in his providence. Thirdly, he just wants to know, we don't know actually who wrote the book, even though the book is named after Ruth, I don't know who wrote the book and why exactly. How the book of Ruth is an amazing story. It's only four short chapters, uh, but it's one of my favorite books in the Bible because it's a book that shows God's faithfulness. As I said before, it shows God's providence and sovereignty over all things. And it's a book that shows us the consequences of turning away from the Lord. But it's a book that also shows us uh, a woman of integrity and faith. Uh, and it's also a book with a love story in it as well. Uh, and ultimately, it's a book that points forward to, to the Lord Jesus Christ. So even if it's four chapters, it's a very exciting book and something that we can learn a lot from about God and, and ourselves, I hope, as well. So just things to, to know. Firstly, set in the time of Judges. Secondly, it's named after Ruth, who's, who's not a Jew. She's a Moabitess, as we're going to see, uh, which, is, which is important. Uh, and thirdly, it's an exciting book. Um, and hopefully uh, you'll be excited by it as we read through it. So with that in mind, we're going to stuck, get stuck into these first five or six verses. So verse one opens by saying, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So as I said, uh, this was set in the time of the judges, and that was a time um, that was very unstable for the people of Israel, spiritually speaking. Uh, they were all over the place. Uh, there was no king. Everyone did what they wanted in this time, more or less. So just imagine Edinburgh, or imagine Nidri even more specifically without the police in it. Sorry? No police in Nidri. What would, what, would, what would things be like here? In Edinburgh, there were no police. Chaos. Chaos, exactly. Uh, well, the same thing was true about the people of Israel in the time of the judges. Uh, everyone was doing whatever they wanted. Uh, it was a bit of madness going on up and down the country. And we're told uh, that during this time there was a famine in the land. There's no food. Uh, and when the, the author says there's a famine in the land, and we just read that, we understand that actually the the author here is actually making a theological point because famine in the Old Testament uh, was usually sent by God because the people were being unfaithful to the Lord. Often when there's a famine or there's a drought, uh, it's the Lord disciplining his people. Uh, and so the famine here is a consequence probably of the people sinning against the Lord, as we've been noting from the book of Judges. And we know this, I think, because... In this verse, uh, 
the town Bethlehem is mentioned. And the town Bethlehem, anyone know what that means? House of bread. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Bethlehem means the house of bread. Okay. Uh, in other words, this was a really fertile place for growing wheat. Uh, and so basically, Bethlehem should have been Warburton's on tap. Uh, there should have been lots of hovis kicking about the place. Uh, but the very place where bread should be flowing is facing a famine. And that's because this town uh, in particular is facing, is facing God's discipline. And it's at this point we're introduced to our first character, uh, a man called Elimelech. And verse 1 and 2 says that Elimelech has a choice to make. Does Elimelech stay in Bethlehem and mourn over the people's sin and trust the Lord to provide for him and his family? Or does he leave the promised land and try and find riper fields? He's got a choice to make. Does he stay or does he go? Does he stay in Bethlehem? Yes, there's a famine, but it's it's, it's supposed to be where the God God's people are supposed to be. Uh, will he mourn over his sin, maybe the people's sin, and turn back to the Lord and, and trust in him? Or, or will he go elsewhere? And really, the decision should have been an easy one. And it's this, he should have stayed faithful to God. He should have cried out to the Lord. He should have, tr turned, he should have turned to him and cried out and asked the Lord to provide for bread, the bread that they needed. But instead, Elimelech decides to move his family down to Moab. And again, the author here is making a, a theological point. He's making a point here. Elimelech doesn't just simply leave the house of bread and move to another part of Israel. He moves to Moab. He moves to a spiritual wasteland. And again, if you're a Jew reading this back in the day, uh, that would have been a <gasps> moment. What's a an Israelite going to a non-Israelite place like Moab, especially because of the history of Israel and Moab. Uh, the origins of Moab are not very good. The, uh, the Moabites came about because of an incestuous relationship between Lot and his daughters. And we see that in Genesis 19, 30 to 34. And Numbers 25 tells us that the Moabite women seduced the men from Israel and they ended up worshipping false gods, uh, and the Lord ended up judging them. And the beginning of Judges, chapter 3, tells us that the Moabite king invaded Israel and took over part of the land. So in other words, the beginnings are not very good. This is, the beginnings are an incestuous relationship. They've tempted the people before away from the Lord, and that, that, that's ended up in judgment. They worship false gods. And they've attacked the people at different times in history. So it doesn't sound like the ideal place to, to, to bring up your family. <laughs> Here's Elimelech moving from the safety of Bethlehem, the safety of being God's land, the promised land, to going to a place like Moab. It's not, it's not the safest option for them. It's not the most sound option for them. Uh, he's deserting the house of bread, basically, for the house of sin. Yes, Moab might have had food, but there's more at stake here. Again, he's making a decision to move away from the Lord. And uh, again, this should be an easy decision because Elimelech's name means my God is king. Elimelech's name literally means my God is king. He should have thought, you know what? God is king, and I'm going to trust in him, because that was the very meaning of his name. <laughs> He's in the house of bread, Bethlehem. Everyone knew that. His actual name means my God is king. And yet, Elimelech decides to move his family to Moab. Uh, his decisions here are showing that God wasn't king in Elimelech's life. So his move to Moab, when we just read it, we just read it, oh, he's just moving from one place to another place, but it's actually a spiritual decision he's making here. 
in leaving Bethlehem, not just leaving their home, but they're also turning their back on the Lord. They're, they're saying, we don't trust the Lord to provide for our needs uh, as they move about down to a different place. And as I was thinking about this, this move that Limelech mo- makes in the house of bread uh, to Moab and the decision that, that he makes, I was challenged by it because we all have decisions to make, don't we, in life? Every day we make decisions. Uh, and the main decision that we make each day and each week and each month and uh, in the big decisions of life is, will we trust God when life gets tough particularly or, or will we abandon ship? Will we trust God when life gets tough or, or will we go and abandon ship? Will God be king of our lives or will comfort and security come first? Uh, and if we're honest, we're, we're often like a limelech, aren't we? We, we struggle to trust God, especially when life gets tough. Uh, I don't know about you, but when I'm making a decision, I often make a decision based on my comfort and my security rather than God being king of my life uh, and bringing glory to him. Uh, and that the commitments that we make and the choices that we make actually show our hearts. Eliminate's decision here is showing where his heart is, showing that God isn't king. And the choices that we make every day and the choices that we make every week and month reveal where we put our trust. It's not just saying I trust God on a Sunday and I read his word. But the choices that we make show whether we trust God or not. Does that make sense? And so here's Elimelech. He's moving from Bethlehem uh, to Moab. And he's showing uh, that he doesn't trust the Lord and that God is not king of his life. And so Elimelech and his family moved to Moab, to Moab. Uh, and to begin with, probably they thought, wow, this is a great decision. <laughs> There's food here. There's food in Moab. Well, the, those losers in Israel are still hungry. We've made a great decision here. And he probably justified in his heart. And the, the rest of the family thought, we've made a really good decision here. Uh, everything's going well. Uh, and he reminded me as I was reading through the text of the prodigal son. The prodigal son's like this, isn't isn't he, in the New Testament? Uh, He goes off, takes his father's inheritance, and and probably to begin with, everything was great. He he had the parties, he had the friends, he had the money in his pocket, he had lots of food, he's probably dining out. You know, everything was amazing. He felt like he was in the land of plenty, and probably that's what Limelech felt in the family. You know, we're in a, a good place now. Yeah, we've left our people behind, we've left the promised land, but it doesn't matter, we've got food on our plate. But the text soon moves, doesn't it, in verse 3, and turns sour. Uh, And Elimelech dies, verse 3. Elimelech's made his decision. He's taken his family there. But verse 3 is very stark. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died. And she was left with her, with the two sons. Uh, And the text doesn't tell us his age, but he couldn't have been old. He probably thought, he would have lived many years in Moab as a family, and yet he's gone. And now a wife is left without a husband, and the kids are left without a dad. No one to fend for them and look after them. Now at this point, again, Naomi's now got a decision. Uh, Limelech's had a decision. He's taken his family down to Moab. Now Naomi's got a decision. She could now go back to Bethlehem, couldn't she? She could take the two sons back to the family home, to the promised land. She could travel back to Bethlehem or she can fight it out in Moab. Uh, And the text says she stays put. They stay there for 10 years. Why did she move back to Moab? Why did she go, uh, why did she move back to Bethlehem? Why did she stay in, in Moab? We're not sure, again, the text doesn't say, but I'd hazard a guess there was probably her pride. Uh, she probably didn't want to return to Bethlehem because of what everyone might say about her. She probably replayed the conversations in her head. Look, the, the people would have said as she came through the town, look, here comes the lady who walked away from the Lord. Look, the decisions she's made now, she's lost her husband and she's returned a widow. Look how the Lord has judged her because that's how the people of Israel would have thought. They would have thought, oh, she made a simple decision now that God's judged her and she's made a poor decision. Uh, no one wants to ter- 
return to a place with their tail behind their legs, do they? <laughs> Between their legs, sorry. You want to return, she's going to return, she wants to return with money, with food in her pockets, with things going well. She doesn't want to return empty handed. Uh, let me give a little bit of application here or a bit of side application. And that's this, the biggest obstacle to coming to the Lord and the biggest obstacle when we walk away from the Lord and returning to him is, is our pride, isn't it? So it's always our pride. We always think, I'm not going back to the Lord because I'm going to have to say sorry for my sin. I'm not going to come back to the Lord because of what other people are going to think about me. But in order to come back to the Lord, and in order to come to the Lord in the first place, we have to eat humble pie, don't we? We have to eat humble pie. We have to admit our sin. We have to sometimes repair broken relationships. The thing we need to remember, and that Naomi needs to know here, is that the God of the Bible is like that father in the, the prodigal son who always has his arms open for his children. When they, when they went off, like Elimelech has and Naomi and the two sons, there's always a way back. But the way back is through humility. The way back is by repenting and returning to the Lord. And so if you're in that place maybe this evening, where pride's in the way of you coming back to the Lord or there's things in your life you need to admit and confess, then do that and know that the Lord is always ready to, to accept you back. Don't let pride get in the way from returning to the Lord. Anyway, the text tells us that she decides to stay in Moab. And we see that in verse three and four. Uh, and her boys take Moabite wives. They take Moabite wives. And again, the, the author is making a point here. The boys take foreign wives, which is, again is a picture of unfaithfulness in the Old Testament. Because in the Old Testament, foreign wives often led to the husbands worshipping false gods. Uh, to worshipping idols. And you don't have to turn there now, but Deuteronomy 7 tells us that, that God told the people, do not marry the other nations, not because they're foreigners, but because they worship other gods and they're going to drag you away. Uh, and yet, here we again see uh, the sons, they've moved to Moab and they've taken Moabite wives. Uh, it was a spiritually dangerous choice, but yet they did it. However, Naomi and her, her sons and, and Elimelech before them have already decided God's not king. And so why not just jump all in? Might as well marry the local girls as well. And so that's what they do. And again, verses, verse 5 shows us that the consequences are heavy here. Uh, and there's two consequences. The first consequence it, uh, here is that uh, the, the women are barren. Again, we don't... We should read over that, but uh, in the 10 years that they're married or, or so, the women don't produce any children. And again, that's a sign of that the fact, that, that's a sign that God's blessing was not on the decision that these people have made to go to Moab. And on top of that, to end a very difficult 10 years for Naomi, her sons die as well. Uh, and imagine you're Naomi after all that. You've been there 10, 10 years. You've left the comforts of your home and your family and the Lord's blessing. You've relocated into a new land. And now at the end of the 10 years, you've got nothing. You're a widower because uh, your husband's died and your children are dead as well. And you're alone. You've pretty much lost everything. All she's left with is a couple of foreign daughter-in-laws who are now free to marry other men. She's got no protection because the men were the ones who provided protection and it was the men who provided the money for food uh, and provided the food for the family. And so Naomi has travelled to Moab with her husband and with her sons and she's lost everything. Everything that was dear to her. Uh, and I just want you to notice that again that the choices that the family have made have led to death. Uh, Elimelech has died the two sons have died and they might have had food to begin with but the decision they've made ha has not been good and here's what we need to remember as christians every time we leave the lord we're leaving the house of bread and we're leading towards destructive paths and that's what the picture is here 
They've left the house of bread and they've led, it's led to a destructive path. And that's the same for every Christian. Uh, every time we make a decision that's foolish, we're leaving the house of bread, the house of God, and we're moving towards a destructive path. And the grass always looks green on the other side, but it never delivers. The way of unfaithfulness always leads to death. Sin promises much, and yet it never delivers. Satan offers us the world, but his lies lead to the grave. The world offers us satisfaction, but it always leaves us wanting more. So the decision that they've made uh, have led to destructive consequences. And yet how often are we like Elimelech and the family? We're always tempted by the greener grass, aren't we? By the greener grass of Moab. Moab looks good, doesn't it? <laughs> Sin looks good. We're tempted to compromise our faith. We're tempted to walk back to our old lives. We're tempted to follow Jesus half-heartedly half and do a bit of this and do a bit of that. When, we're, when our backs are against the wall and we're going through suffering, we run after security and comfort everywhere but the Lord. We leave the promised land to go to Moab. So these opening verses, uh, as you read over them maybe later again, are, 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 are a lesson for us. They're a lesson to not mess around with sin to not play with it and to remember that God is always king and to trust in him. I was, uh, as I was thinking about the text and I was just thinking about the, the application there, I was uh, reading the news this morning. I don't know if you saw this, this news story um, on BBC News this morning. Basically, there's a couple in America who, despite all the evidence on the news and in the hospitals about COVID-19, decided it was all a all a hoax. Uh, they decided it was, I don't know, made up by the government to, to dupe them into buying medical stuff. I don't know what they thought. Uh, and so when they started to get the symptoms of COVID themselves, they ignored all the advice and decided it was just a bad cold or maybe at worst a flu. And it was all in their minds. And so they ignored all the advice. And sadly, the, the husband was hospitalized and the wife died. Uh, they didn't listen. Uh, and probably if they went to hospital earlier, they could have got the respiratory machines and everything else they needed to, to survive and, and ride out COVID. Uh, but because they didn't believe it was real, uh, they didn't listen to the advice and they ended up in a, in a horrendous position. And I thought that was a good picture of what's happened here with Elimelech and a good picture of our lives as well. When we don't listen to the voice of wisdom then similar things happen to us spiritually. And so we need to listen to the voice of wisdom, don't we? We need to stick near to the Lord. We need to learn from Elimelech and Naomi and the decisions that they made to walk away from the Lord. We need to remember that the grass isn't green on the other side. And we need to remember that God is always king, no matter what we're going through. However, this story, like I said, is not just a story of the destructive consequences of sin. This is also a story of God's providence. So let me, me say that at the beginning, that he's in control of all things and that he's working out his purposes for our good and his glory. And we see that in verse six, that things begin to turn. Uh, and I'll end here that it says, then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the field of Moab that the Lord visited his people uh, and given them food. And here's the hope of, of the book of Ruth. The hope it's not the people in it, because the people in it are sinners. The hope in the book of Ruth is that God is, is faithful. That God is working in the background of the story and he's going to bring good out of a bad situation. Uh, and here's the thing, we often lack trust in God's faithfulness. And we see that in the book of Judges, how they just sin against the Lord again and again. But the Lord doesn't abandon his people. And that's the story of Naomi and that's going to be the story uh, of Ruth, who we're going to meet later on in the book. The Lord brings about his purposes among an unfaithful people. He brings about redemption out of the sin of his people. In the darkness of life, there is always light when God is at work. And again, verse six is that glimmer of hope. Bethlehem has food again. The Lord has visited his people and he's given them food. The Lord, I'm so sorry. And so Naomi decides to return to her home. 
And notice the Lord is stripped of everything she has known and loved. But the Lord is still with her. And he's opened this way for her to go home. And we're going to see there's going to be good that comes out of this as well. And that's the same with us again. Often the Lord strips us of everything that we have, that everything we've placed our trust in, so that we might trust in him and turn to him. And when we return to him, he runs to us and embraces us. And there's always hope. And like I said, this whole book points to Christ. Uh, and so do these opening verses, because in a similar way that Naomi and Elimelech left home, in a very different way, Jesus left his home as well. But not because he's being unfaithful to God, but because he's being faithful to God and his purposes in leaving heaven to come to our sin-soaked world to die on the cross for our sins. And whereas Naomi had everything stripped of her, her husband and her children for uh, in her life as that she was in Moab, the Lord also had everything stripped from him. He had his friends and his clothes and his dignity, his relationship with the Father, all stripped from him as he hung on the cross. And he died on the cross. And he did that so that we'd be restored to God and so that we would never have to leave the house of bread again. Because Jesus is the bread of life, isn't he? Whoever comes to him will never be hungry. Whoever drinks of him will never be thirsty again. And so this story in a small way points forward to Jesus and what he would do on the cross. That everything was stripped of him so that we would be spiritually full. But today and for eternity. And so it reminds us once again today that God is king and that we can trust him. And whatever's going on in our lives. Amen. 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 Uh, I'll stop any questions on that text or any comments before we pray for each other.